She's a regular contributor to Out and Around, Huffington Post, and Lesbian.com, where she writes from the crossroads of parenthood, suburbia, and lesburbia. I just made that up. Please welcome Cheryl dumas Nil. I moved out of San Francisco 14 years ago to the suburbs to shack up with my wife. And um, when you do that, when you move to the suburbs from San Francisco, you have to turn in your queer credibility card at the westernmost point of the Bay Bridge. Um, it was a sad adjustment for me, but we were able to come back into town a lot and bask in queer culture um, until we had two kids. And now my life revolves around about a five mile radius from my house most days. Uh, so it's a real treat to be here. Um, and queer literature really has become so much more important to me now, um, probably than it ever has been in my life because when I'm waiting for my car to be washed or I'm waiting in the lobby of the dojo or I'm waiting in the lobby of the place for my kids to take music lessons or I'm waiting, waiting, waiting in all these places, I can open a book like Valencia or like Cha-Ching and it's like putting on an oxygen mask. Um, so thank you supporters of queer literature and makers of queer literature who are here tonight because it's really making a difference, I'm sure, in not just my life, but in many people's lives who are in far more dire situations than mine being in the suburbs 35 miles away from San Francisco. <laughs> so I am going to read uh, Walnut Creek in the House. <laughs> um, I am going to read uh, from my memoir. <laughs> Come on, you know, I mean, the, the only lesbian cred I have, <laughs> it's the WC. <laughs> um, the only lesbian cred I have is that I drive a Subaru with like athletic equipment in the back, but it's my kids' athletic equipment, so it just, it doesn't even count. <laughs> I, I am the official scorekeeper for the Little League team though, so that's kind of cool. Um, I'm gonna read from a, a time when I was trying to become a parent uh, from the memoir that Michelle mentioned, Love Song for Baby X. And uh, I'm gonna read from the end. We're gonna enter the story when I'm in um, hour 24 of labor with my first son trying to be born. Um, the first 24 hours weren't that bad, really. And then he got super serious about showing up, and that's where this chapter starts. I'll mention two names. One is Tracy, and that's my wife, and the other is Tina, and she's the doula uh, who we hired to help us during the birth. Crescendo. Red stop lights, green go lights, Flashing orange construction barricade lights reflected off the black asphalt, our darkened windshield. White lights flickering like fireflies in the trees as Tracy drove stop, go, stop, go, stop, go, taking back streets to the hospital. Three blocks away from our destination, my contractions shifted from the slicing pain of cervix dilation to the downward pressure of a waterfall, the undeniable urge to push. Not wanting to flip Tracy's panic switch, I kept this information to myself. When Tracy parked the car curbside, I opened my door, swung my feet out onto the sidewalk, and stood up just in time for my water to break, soaking my clothes, splashing onto the concrete, sluicing into the gutter, chased by a contraction that ran through me like a river urgent to flush that baby out, out, out. I raised one finger in the air and said, I'm pushing, then fell into Tracy's body, wrapping my arms around her neck, boring my head into her shoulder, bearing down into the pressure, riding that river I couldn't not push. I became part of this force like a god hand pressing down on the baby, fighting to set him free. And then Tina's car pulled up behind ours. Tracy yelled over my head, she's pushing. Tina ran to the ER to get the wheelchair, but the contraction was ending, so I stood up straight and told Tracy, it's okay, let's go in. We made it five steps toward the automatic doors before the next contraction thundered in, tens of thousands of pounds of water crashing through me, rushing down to get this baby out, out, out. As that contraction ended, Tina arrived with an ER attendant, offering me a wheelchair with a wire mesh seat that looked like a medieval torture device. No way. I shook my head. I'm walking in. Then I told my ghost-faced wife, I'm okay, let's go. 
But someone lowered my body back into that seat, and off we rolled, each rattle and bump stabbing through me as I closed my eyes and whispered to our baby, hang in there, little guy. It's going to be okay. And we were okay, better than okay. Maybe this was a gift of having three miscarriages, a gift of having spent months fearing I would never get to this place. When active labor finally charged up, it was like a blessing, a privilege I had earned. Over the past two years, I'd had so many dreams about labor, about showing up at the hospital months too early only to be sent home, about rushing into the maternity ward certain my baby was coming, then finding out I wasn't actually pregnant at all about watching my friend give birth while I stood by stroking my own empty belly. Those dreams had ended in a disappointment so thick it tasted like dirt. But now that birth was finally taking my body over for real, I praised every single contraction that brought our baby forward. I was never, not even once, not even for a second, afraid. I wasn't oblivious, though, to the fact that others were scared. When my wheelchair sped into labor and delivery, Tina called out to the nurses at the reception desk, she's pushing, and all hell broke loose. Someone yelled, room three, take her to room three. A flurry of pastel-colored scrubs blurred around me as they wheeled me into the room. Nurses rushed to prepare the space, throwing open curtains, slamming drawers, ripping open glove packs, tearing down bed sheets. After 24-plus hours laboring in meditative privacy at home, this sudden burst of anxiety, it was the last thing I wanted. So I stood up out of my wheelchair, raised my hands in the air, and said in my calmest possible voice, will everyone please slow down, please? And they did. Somehow, bone deep, I knew we would have enough time knew that we were going to be just fine. Birth had finally arrived, and all I had to do was follow her lead, which I did over and over again. As each contraction consumed me, I lost my conscious self to a frenzied dance with the birth beast, lost all contact with my surroundings, with Tracy holding my hand, with Tina standing guard, with the nurses doing their nursing things. Then the contraction eased, spitting, spitting me back into the room, bug-eyed and endorphin high, giddily chattering to Tracy, may I have some ice chips, please? Oh, good. I said, please. I'm so glad I'm still polite. I didn't want to be one of those mean, cussing, laboring women. Ice chips? Thanks. Tina shook her head, smiling. Endorphins are a good thing. Aren't they? I chirped. <laughs> Before the ice could melt in my mouth, another contraction hit like a badly timed wave. Okay, baby, here comes another one, I said. Then I spit out the ice, and I was gone, toppled like a wiped-out surfer clawing for air. Jump cuts. That's how my memory of birth plays, 30-second fragments of bell-bright clarity spliced by tornado blurs. The clarity of those moments between contractions still stuns me, that I could recite my medical record number by rote, that I could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a by-the-books nurse quoting midwifery guru Ina May Gaskin to convince her not to stick an IV in my arm. That I could talk to my baby as I watched a mirror in a mirror, the crown of his beet red head retreating behind the closing eyelid of my vagina. That I could say, wrong way, kiddo, wrong way, and clench my muscles to push him back where he had been, then laugh as the next contraction sucked me into its ripside. Though the contractions loosened my grip on everything else, that communication with baby boy never wavered, and fear never showed up, not even when I heard the words heart rate dropping, then saw in that mirror the midwife tickling baby's partially exposed scalp, then heard the amplified rhythm of his heartbeat rev back up. Don't worry, I told Tracy. I've read about this. It's normal. Then back to baby, you're doing great, little guy. You're doing just fine. Now here comes another one. And then I threw my head back and roared as the next wave barreled through. With each contraction, that birth force grew stronger, pulling me into its vortex each time. And just when I thought it would swallow me, when I thought that I would disappear into its black hole for good, I heard the midwife's voice break through. Whoa, whoa, stop pushing. But I couldn't pull back the forward motion, that power raging through so much larger than me. 
No matter. Seconds later, I heard a call, take him, take him. And my hands reached blindly out, hooking under two oil slick bird wings, his two slippery arms, and then it happened. I pulled him on to my chest, our purple and screaming baby, our naked and flailing baby, our baby with the skin pinking up like a sunrise erasing the night as his body curled into mine and his mouth broke open into a wounded animal's howl. And then I started laughing, watching this squirming newborn wild with hunger press his mouth into my flesh, work his lips against my ribs, already rooting for milk. And then Tracy started laughing. And then the entire birth team started laughing, and then I was crying, saying, I can't believe you're here. He's here. I can't believe you're here. While a nurse tucked warmed blankets around his body, tenting him in the heat rising off my skin, I lifted baby boy toward my breast. Let me help you. As his mouth sealed around my nipple, his cloudy eyes opened and looked into mine. You're here, I whispered. I grabbed Tracy's hand, babe. He's here. Thank you. Cheryl Dumas-Nell, thank you so much for coming all the way out from Walnut Creek. Thank you.